Hello and welcome to a new exciting episode of the Witch Hunter podcast. You can find us on audioepics.com, audiobooksontape.com and bandcamp.com. My name is Domin de Groot, I am the author and narrator of Witch Hunter. We are coming to the climax of our story of Witch Hunter, and so uh, I know that you're probably just looking forward to the continuation of it. So all I have left to say is just sit back and enjoy the 10th chapter of Witch Hunter. Inferno. The streets of Seven Peaks were strangely deserted as Ludlove made his way to the headquarters of his former order. His bare feet felt cold and sensitive on the cobbled streets. Now, more than ever, he wondered how Semina managed to go without shoes so effortlessly at all times. The headquarters were close to the cathedral, so it didn't take long before he managed to reach the dark, imposing building. It was constructed in a pointed, vertical style. There were three roofs, the middle one towering over the other two. The red stained glass windows were equally tall and pointed. The gates of the black metal fence surrounding the simple front garden of the headquarters were wide open when Ludlow arrived. He stopped dead in his tracks when he met a stream of careless witch hunters in full uniform hurrying out of the building. He looked away to hide his face, but they were so hurried they didn't even take notice of him. When they had passed, he just stood there, amazed at the difference clothing could make. Nevertheless, even though it was more than useful to go unnoticed here, he would absolutely need his gear. Without it, he was just an ordinary man. He wondered what manner of atrocity was already happening in Seven Peaks that it required the immediate attention of at least a dozen witch hunters at once. He feared there was already more going on than the red lightning they had witnessed before. He looked at the open door. It was tempting to just walk in, but he knew he couldn't do that. A beggar in the streets was a common sight. A beggar in the witch hunter headquarters would immediately draw attention to himself. Fortunately, he knew of another way to enter the building. Ludlove looked around to make sure no one was watching, and then he took his chance. Running into the garden, he dashed in the direction of the backyard. He bowed low as he passed a window. It was a colorful stained glass window depicting Sancta Gwendala's victory over Gunter Orff. There was no light on it now, so he probably wouldn't have been noticed, but he wouldn't risk it. The backyard was quite deep. There was a hedge labyrinth, and there were several tall trees in the back. The darkened garden bathed in a ruddy light, not only from the windows, but also from the frightening hue the sky had taken on. His attention now was focused on the ivy that grew on the wall. He knew that Lady Hoskiv's personal office was located behind the window overlooking the garden. He had to assume she wasn't there now, and so he used the windowsill as a stair so he could climb onto the thick ivy roots. His feet weren't used to this rough terrain, but he ignored the pain and discomfort. Above him, just below one of the smaller roots, there had to be a window he could use to enter a rarely used attic. No one would come looking for him there, and he'd be able to make his way through the rest of the building. Once he had climbed high enough, he was faced with the flaw in his hastily concocted plan. The window was closed, and there was no way to open it from the outside. Semina might have attempted some sort of spell, but she wasn't here now. Even Fulcrin was not available to him. The only alternative was brute force. He made certain he had a sure grip on the ivy and wouldn't fall down, and then he made a fist. He took a deep breath, bit his teeth, and then smashed the glass with his bare fist. He wanted to cry out with pain. There were shards of glass sticking out of his bleeding knuckles. He pulled himself up a bit higher, 
straining his muscles, and used his bleeding hand to open the latch on the inside. Now he could open the window. Once that was done, he slowly and awkwardly crawled inside, carefully treading his bare feet to avoid stepping into glass. Once he had entered, he knelt down onto the wooden floorboards and ventured one more quick gaze out of the window before closing it. No one had seen him or come to find out what had smashed the window. Now that he had entered the attic, he knew the reason why no one had paid attention was because there was something louder and more important going on inside. There were raised voices and many hasty steps of heavy boots to be heard downstairs. As he sat there in the lonely attic, he took a moment to inspect his fist. Sucking air through his teeth, he slowly pulled out the largest of the glass shafts. Bright red blood surged out immediately. He ignored it and proceeded to remove the two smaller shards. His hand was full of blood, but the actual cuts weren't so bad. He could still move his fingers without too much pain. He would need to bandage the wound, though, or the blood would keep on flowing. Looking around, he only saw dusty chandeliers, ugly portraits, outdated maps and broken furniture here. There was nothing he could use. Grumbling with impatience and annoyance, he ripped a piece from one of his trouser legs and used it to bandage his hand. The coarse sackcloth was unfit for the task, but it was better than nothing. Now he had to make his way down and find his uniform. It wouldn't be easy, but he would be powerless without his weapons and his ring. Fulcrin would definitely come in handy. He prayed to the goddess that Sermina was safe and that Sigurd wouldn't put her in any unnecessary danger. He didn't know the lad, but he had come across as something of a daredevil at their initial meeting. Whatever happened now, whether Lucas could be stopped or not, Ludlov would be there with Sermina at the end. As he thought this, he suddenly saw a bright red flash reflected in the room. He turned and looked through the window. What he saw there shook him to the core of his being. Where before the sky had been ruddy and the clouds dark, now the sky had turned black and the clouds a luminous bright crimson. They were swirling in a slow but massive vortex above the great triangle. That was where Samina had lived. As he took a careful step to the window, he saw the silhouettes of crow-stepped gables and pointed roofs. Behind them was a glow far brighter than what was in the sky. Red flashes of lightning crackled between heaven and earth. He could hear inhuman screams of terror in the far distance. Elsewhere in the city, there were similar points of red light. The earth was opening up and something was coming out. Again he worried about Samina and felt a glow inside, not unlike those red lights in the distance. For a split second, he wondered whether he indeed loved her in the way Doctor had suspected, and if he did, what that meant for his life's purpose. The thought remained unfinished, as it was quickly cast aside by the cold hard truth that none of it mattered if Lucas rose. His equipment. Fortunately, he had an idea of where he would be able to find it. There was a storage room on the ground floor, close to the kitchen. It was only a matter of avoiding the other witch hunters, which would be the real challenge. His outfit alone was alarming enough, but in these closed quarters his face would be quickly recognized. It had become quiet now. Perhaps the time was right. He put his ear against the door and heard nothing. So he opened it. There was a narrow corridor and a steep wooden staircase leading down. He descended and entered a wide, empty corridor. It was predominantly wood, with gold-accented red carpeting and several paintings in ornate frames on the wall. There was an opening to a wide staircase leading downward a little bit further ahead. 
He knew someone might come out of a door and walk by at any moment, so he had to be quick. He also knew that those stairs led straight to the main hall where there were bound to be people. There was a servant's stairway he was aware of, though, which was located behind one of the doors on his left. That was his only viable option. He tiptoed through the corridor, passing the staircase. He could hear footsteps in the hallway downstairs, but it didn't sound like they were headed his way. The way to the servant's quarter seemed agonizingly long, but at last he reached the door and opened it. It was a square, empty room. In the middle of the right wall, there was a narrow staircase down, much like the one he had used to descend from the attic. He took the stairs and entered the kitchen. It was quiet, dark, and empty there. Most of the activity in the building was probably concentrated in the council room. Ludlow assumed there would be fierce discussions about the red lights and what the order would have to do about it. He made his way to the kitchen storage room where he found an apron and a toque. It was the only disguise he could possibly find. He quickly put on both items. He would probably still look strange wearing his prison outfit underneath, but it was the best he could do. As he closed the door of the storage room, he noticed that the door to the downstairs corridor was open. There were voices there. A group of witch hunters passed by, speaking in excited tones. He thought he heard one of them mention his name and stiffened. They hadn't seen him, though. When they had passed, he went to the kitchen door and peeked out into the corridor. At the end of that corridor, there were a few steps down leading to a door. That was the door to the storage room where he would find his equipment. Wasting not another second, he made his way for that door. He knew it was never locked, because no one in their right mind would ever even consider breaking into the witch hunter headquarters and stealing from them. He opened the door as slowly and softly as he could manage, ignoring his nerves, and slipped inside. It was dark here. If only Semina were here now, he thought. Experience told him that his eyes would soon adjust and he would be able to make out some basic shapes, but he didn't have much time. Luckily, he was fairly familiar with this place and he knew that there were a number of heavy chests stored together, some of which contained items that belonged to convicts. Certainly one of them would hold his possessions. It was just a matter of finding a source of light and looking for the right chest. The chests might be locked, but he knew how to open such locks using nothing more than a dagger and a pin. It was going to be tricky, but he was still pleased with how surprisingly well this utterly unprepared operation was going. He immediately regretted that thought as the door opened wide and a young witch hunter's silhouette blocked the light from the corridor. What are you doing here, chef? He exclaimed. This room is only for... Ludlove couldn't see the young man's face, but his sudden silence told him all he needed to know. He felt himself shrink with humiliation. Hm. Master Ludlove? The young witch hunter's voice sounded surprised, disappointed, and slightly mocking all at once. Damn it, Ludlove thought. So this was to be the end of the mighty Ludlove of Seven Peaks. Caught while hiding in a dark room dressed as some pauper who had just been promoted to chef. That thought was too much for him. Hold still. I need my gear. Now. The young man placed himself in the doorway, spreading his arms and legs to block Ludlov's exit. You can't... you can't be here. You were condemned to death. Ludlov sighed. Condemned, nearly executed and escaped. He was aware of his own arrogance, considering his position. No one needs to know I was here. Just let me take my items and I'll be on my way. The young witch hunter shook his head nervously. Ludlov thought he recognized him now. He was one of the whelps that were being trained by Lady Eckstein, one of his few female colleagues. Gerhardt, isn't it? Gerald! Right. 
I always wondered why you wanted to be a witch hunter, Gerald. Ludlove slowly advanced on the young man. You seem more of a bookish sort to me. Can't imagine you ever actually killing anyone. Despite his obvious nerves, Gerald remained adamant. No, master, you are right, but I will stop a criminal from escaping. Ludlove admired that. Look, friend. He hoped a more cordial approach would do the trick. I know you have no qualms with me, and you are only trying to perform your duty, so listen to me. This city will be destroyed so utterly it might as well have never been here, and the deed will be done by none other than Lucas, the evil himself, if nobody stops him. So just let me go. One escaped prisoner won't make the difference. Oh, I think he will, said a familiar voice. With royal grace, Lady Hoskiv appeared from behind the young man, who immediately stepped aside and bowed to her. The lady was carrying a lantern which brought an agreeable light to the surroundings. Leave us, Anishit. Yes, my lady. Gerald was obviously glad to be gone. As he made his way back into the corridor, Hoskiv turned to him one last time and said, You have done well, young one. The boy smiled gratefully. Then he left. The Grand General subjected Ludlove to an inscrutable look of investigation from head to toe. You look ridiculous in that outfit, Ludlove. Take your uniform and get out of here. Ludlove just stood there, wondering if she had actually said what he thought he had heard. My lady? You heard me. What's going on in the city right now is demonic business on a scale we have never encountered before. Seven Peaks needs its finest witch hunter. It's time to fight alongside each other once more, old friend. Ludlove was still too astonished to react. Right. It's that black chest you need over there. It's not locked. He shook off his complete bewilderment and made for the chest she had indicated. He sighed contentedly when he found his uniform, his pistol and his trusty rapier. He immediately threw off the dirty rags he was wearing and changed into his witch hunter gear then and there. He threw away the sackcloth bandage and covered his bloodied hand with his glove. That would have to do. Lady Hoskiv did not look away while he changed clothes and he didn't care. Well? I'm sorry, my lady. Ludlow fastened the copper buttons of his jerkin. I cannot fight by your side. The Grand General furrowed her brow. Why not? I know the source of the true evil. And it's not that red glow outside. Lady Hoskiv pursed her lips, as she always did when she started to lose her patience. Ludlove knew it wasn't a good sign. But he couldn't worry about her promises or her threats anymore. There have been sightings of creatures out there in the streets, Ludlove. Black wolves with eyes like burning lumps of coal. They are rampaging through the Great Triangle right now, mauling civilians. Ludlove buckled the belt over his jerkin. The sheaths containing his rapier and his rarely used dagger were still attached to it. I know there are monsters, my lady. There will be more. From above and from below. He tucked his pistol beneath his belt, below his left arm, where he could quickly draw it. He wasn't one for holsters when it came to pistols. They were too obvious and too slow. I wish you a great deal of success in your fight against those creatures, lady. Ludlove checked his rapier. My objective lies elsewhere. He clad himself in his long cloak and reverently lifted his hat out of the chest. With a confident smile, he put it on and became Ludlove again. Witch hunter? No. Demon hunter, he thought. I'm ready. My ring? When at last he looked Lady Hoskiv in the eye, he noticed her ill-concealed annoyance. No ring, Ludlove. I will keep it. 
I've heard stories about that ring. Until this crisis is over, the rule remains. A witch hunter shall not employ magically infused items. And yes, calling messenger birds by talking to a stone in a ring does sound like magic to me. <sighs> she still disapproved of the arcanic arts, then. Why do you not fight with us, Ludlov? We need you. This may be the last battle of Seven Peaks. The last battle of the witch hunters. Maybe even the last battle of mankind. I had hoped you would be by my side in this hour. I will continue to hope that you will before the end. Never in all his life had Ludlov imagined that Lady Hoskiv, the Grand General of the Witch Hunter Order, would address him with such humility. The same woman who had publicly given the signal to burn him on a pyre barely an hour ago. As he returned her gaze, he saw her pale grey irises framed in a field of white. There was humility there, but beyond it, there was fear. He resented the fact that it was fear that drove her friendly mien. Well, I would like to forgive and forget how you ordered to burn me alive after I tried to warn you about the very same danger you now want me to help you destroy. But in all truth, I am expected elsewhere in the city where I can be of more use. Again, my lady, I wish you all the best. With a last nod and the tip of his hat, he left the room. No one followed him as he walked through the headquarters. Just when he was about to leave, he noticed that Cardinal Voronitz's diary was no longer in his breast pocket. He smiled and opened the door. Outside, he saw that the clouds were now hanging lower than before. The cathedral tower was wrapped in sinister fog, its top disappearing in the murky darkness. More disturbing than that was the sound. He didn't notice it right away, but when he was on his way through the uncharacteristically lonely streets of Seven Peaks, he noticed a constant dark rumble emerging from deep beneath the surface of the earth. It was as if the very ground itself was waking up from a deep sleep. Red flashes appeared ever more frequently, mostly far away but sometimes alarmingly close. He could hear the screams of people in other parts of the city whenever a flash appeared. It was a pitiful sound that made his heart ache. He shouldn't dwell on it. Ludlow's road was clear. He would enter the sewers once more, this time from the northwest quarter. So far, the northern half of Seven Peaks seemed to be the least troubled by the monsters. He wondered why that was, if indeed Lucas was to be summoned from the abyss beneath the ghost streets. Then again, perhaps that was the very reason, he thought, to draw the attention of the witch hunters away. He found a sewer grate and was quick to open it. Just as he was about to enter the hole, he saw an exceptionally bright flash reflected in the windows of a shop ahead. He turned around and saw the color of fire emanating from deep within the small triangle. Then he saw a black shape rising up over the rooftops. It was a giant raven, like the ones that had stolen the stones. Just before his mind returned to his duty and he entered the sewers, a thought passed through his head, as quickly and brightly as those flashes of red in the sky. Samina's words about power animals. Sigurd had summoned ravens to save both of them from the pyre. Why ravens? The black sickle had never used the raven as a symbol before. Now the animal seemed to be omnipresent in the cult's imagery. Even the masked ones referred to it. Had Sigurd learned the skill to command ravens from the black sickle? Or was the raven Sigurd's own power animal?
Lady Hoskiv scanned the faces of the witch hunters she had collected inside the cathedral. Most were quiet, experienced men and women, but there were some younger and fiercer members there as well. Even with the addition of a garrison of fine guards, it still wasn't an impressive force against the enemy they would have to face. Still, they had little choice. Their most important task was simply keeping the creatures at a distance, and so the Grand General had decided to have most of her troops surround the entry points. Those strange red lights. Oswald, one of Hoskiv's most reliable witch hunters, had told her how he had seen the origin of such an entry point. Oswald had been standing in a street in the Great Triangle when the ground beneath his feet had started to glow. He had just barely escaped a flash of lightning rising up from it into the night sky. Shortly after the monsters had appeared, several black hounds the size of ponies, Oswald had managed to kill one, but ultimately found himself fleeing the other two beasts. The man's testimony had motivated Hoskiv's decision to focus on defending the city from the inside. She had no idea what might come from outside the walls, but it was clear that this enemy, this force, had no need to topple walls or defensive structures. They simply appeared out of the very ground on which this city was built. This put her foe in a horrifyingly advantageous position, forcing Hoskiv to set her priorities. No matter what happened, she would never allow the cathedral to fall. That was the final and most impossible of impossibilities, and so she would stay close to it. In addition, the cathedral tower's high balconies were the perfect location to deploy crossbows and long rifles to keep the enemy at bay and take out the giant ravens if they should seek out the cathedral. She became aware of Gorlivosk standing next to her. The young Inquisitor had proven quite bold and fierce lately. She could see a suitable protégé, maybe even a worthy successor one day beneath his smooth exterior. But by the goddess he was no match for Ludlov by her side. As if he could sense her thoughts, Gorlivosk addressed her on the topic. Do you believe we can take on this battle without Ludlov, my lady? She scowled at him. Ludlov was a great witch hunter, Inquisitor. But we are not here to sniff out magical crimes. We are here to defend the city from the monsters of Luku's own making. This is not a place that depends on the sort of skills that set Ludlov apart. This is war. She had lied, of course. She truly did believe their chances would have improved significantly if Ludlov had joined them, even if it were just for the sake of morale. Still... She would not wallow in guilt over what she had done to him earlier. At the time, the death sentence had been the only option. Perhaps the strange events that were occurring right now might vindicate some of his bizarre ranting about the stones being evil, but there was little evidence of that. When Ludlov's clothes had been confiscated for the execution, Lady Hoskiv had leafed through this so-called manifesto of his. She remained unconvinced, Unless it could be proven that the book had actually been written by Cardinal Voronitz himself, it was most likely nothing more than a falsely attributed, slanderous piece of anti-Voronitzian propaganda. In any case, she had no time or patience for such intellectual matters right now. The stones had been stolen and the city was under attack from a diabolical force. If anything, that made it clear that the enemy was free to attack now that the stones were gone. For all she knew, Ludlov's actions while he had been missing might have been the very cause of the attack. No, it had been the right decision to execute him and the girl. Nevertheless, the whole ordeal had cut deep into the Order's morale and couldn't have occurred at the worst time. Not only had the star of the Order proved to be a murderer and a traitor, his execution had failed and his whereabouts were officially unknown. This, on top of the mayor's death, the cardinal's passing, and the disappearance of the seven stones. It was the worst accumulation of events in recorded history since the midwinter invasion of 222. And to her own knowledge, Lady Hoskiv was the only person who had any chance of keeping this day from becoming even worse.
the last moon of autumn of 1777, the day hell itself rose up into seven peaks. Despite all of this, Gorlivosk stood straight back and unflinching like a real soldier of Seven Peaks. She was proud of him. I will not disappoint you, my lady. Even if Seven Peaks should burn to ashes, even if the demons should rush to this great altar with bleeding claws, even if the very world should fall around us, I will stand with you. She knew the ferocity in his eyes was sincere. Fight then, friend. To the end. Sitting on a boulder, Samina looked around. She had noticed there had been no sign of the children of the ghost streets this time. Perhaps, after the storyteller's death, they had retreated into their holes and caves at last, never to come out again. The thought depressed her. She bowed her head and looked at her feet. Feet that had touched the Sanctissima and were now only a few paces away from the jagged spike of volcanic glass that was the entrance to the abyss. Feet that had almost burned to a crisp that night. In front of her, her light hovered, piercing through the fog and illuminating the entrance to the abyss in a soft, pale glow that caressed the grotesque engravings of heaven, earth, abyss and hell with unfitting gentleness. She knew that Sigurd's hand on her shoulder was supposed to feel reassuring, but she sensed his impatience. He'll come. She didn't turn to face him. I know you have much faith in the witch hunter, Samina. Was that an underhanded reproach? She shook off the thought. What was she thinking? He was her brother, of course he would be distrustful of a witch hunter. I know it's difficult to understand, but he has become my friend. Just a friend? Now she turned around, annoyed. He stood there, leaning on that gnarled staff he had used to summon the ravens. The look in his eyes was inscrutable. Sigurd never used to be inscrutable. She used to be able to read his face like an open book. What do you think, brother? That I would love this man? He shook off the thought. I'm sorry, Samina. I know you would never... I wouldn't. He nodded. Samina did love the witch hunter, of course, just as she loved Sigurd. Maybe differently. She didn't know. Blood love had become dear to her. Looking up at her brother, she wanted to say something, but she couldn't think of anything. There was a silence between them, and silence around them. Suddenly, Samina noticed how she had curled her toes inward. She knew her own body language well enough to realize she was suppressing feelings of discomfort. She scoffed at her own emotions. It had been such a long time. Of course it would feel weird to speak to him now. Still, the silence was too long and she wanted to say something, anything, to break this awful, awkward quiet. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you this past year. Sigurd's face softened. Semina's light reflected in his eyes, making them vibrant. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you and Mother. Mother, I'm sorry I missed her passing. Maybe if you had been there, it wouldn't have happened. She immediately regretted her words. Sigurd looked at her horrified. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that it was your fault for leaving. I just meant that I failed to save her on my own. No. You're right. Sigurd stared off into nothingness. If I had stayed home, we'd still have had the wagon. Maybe we could have evaded the fire. Mother paid the price for my leaving. I know it was important to you. Samina pulled her legs close to herself and hugged her knees. At least, now I do. What do you mean? Sigurd looked at her, somewhat hurt. Well, I never knew why you left. 
she caught herself sounding somewhat defensive about it. He still looked puzzled. I mean, you were never that interested in the black sickle. I don't know why you suddenly felt it was so important to infiltrate them. He smiled somewhat sheepishly. I suppose I never did explain that to you very well, did I? <clears throat> Do you remember what life was back in East Evenendale, Selmina? It was wonderful. Sigurd shook his head. You were too young to understand, I suppose. Oh no, I understood. I knew the villagers mistrusted us. I knew father was the only reason why they even allowed us to settle there. They both knew gypsies hadn't always enjoyed a very good reputation, particularly the Ungra tribe, and for most ordinary folk it was hard to tell the difference between Sintra and Ungra. Sigurd stared at her. After he died, mother had a terribly difficult time there. Did she ever tell you? Yes, she did, Sigurd. She shrugged. I know that's why we left for the city. Where was he going with this? Did you never stop to think why that was? She thought about it for a moment. Because of the Warrenitian editions. Thinking of Ludlove, she experienced the rise of a sudden warmth inside of her, like a small fire lit in the midst of a snowy wood at night. Sigurd ignored her response. Because people like the cultists of the Black Sickle make people like us look very bad, Samina. That's all? Sigurd scowled again. It's not good enough for you. We needed you, Siggy. I don't mean to judge you, but I do wonder what the real reason is why you felt it necessary to infiltrate. I told you. I know how dangerous they are. How they make the world hate all of us. I wanted to bring them down. Samina sighed and played with her hair, her fingers moving swiftly and nervously. It used to be the easiest thing in the world to talk to her brother. She left her hair alone. You did tell me that, and I believe you. But that's not the whole story. I know it isn't, Sigurd. You can tell me. I'll understand. He looked away from her. The movement of his chest exposed his rapid breathing, and the tightness of his lips betrayed his frustration. You won't understand, Samina. The fragility of his voice startled her. It was the first hint of a truly honest answer to her question. You can't understand, and you never will. You don't know how it feels. It was always easy for you. Were there tears in his eyes? Easy? What do you mean? Her brother shrugged. That light. He pointed to the hovering star. It's nothing to you, is it? Healing the ill, summoning good dreams, communicating with animals, and making plants grow even without sunshine or rain. You're a miracle. It was always so hard for me, even the smallest conjuration. Samina frowned. She had never felt any hint of this jealousy in him. Sigurd had always been supportive of her abilities. You joined the Black Sickle because you wanted to be better than me? He didn't respond, looking away to hide his tears. But you have grown better, Sigurd. It worries me that you learn these things in an evil cult, but the way you channeled that power animal tonight, I've never seen anything like that before. He scoffed and shook his head. Turning to her, his eyes were reddened. So you think I joined the Black Sickle because they happened to know how to control my power animal in their magic? He sounded offended at the very notion, and Samina didn't understand why. Didn't you? His eyes widened, and with that, a grin appeared on his face. A large, unsettling grin. He shook his head again, still grinning. It's the other way around, silly. Something tugged at Samina's heart. The look in Sigurd's eye scared her. He approached, and she recoiled. Look here. He handed her his knapsack. 
You will find something inside. She gave him a wary look, then drew her light close to her shoulder and opened the bag to rummage through it. The light reflected on something shiny inside. She grabbed the object to take a look at it. Her heart sank as she took it out of the knapsack. It was a gleaming black mask with a long raven beak for a nose. What what does this mean? It's who I really am, Sam. He smiled again. He never used to smile like that. Who you are? She looked at the empty eyes of the mask, thinking back on the robed figure she had seen in the tunnels. The murderer of the storyteller. Squeezing the mask in a tight grip, she took a deep breath, preparing her question. She shouldn't have to ask, it wasn't necessary. But why did she feel the need to ask? Did you kill a storyteller? It had escaped her lips far more easily than she had expected, rushing out like an escapee from a burning building. Did you steal the stones? She didn't want to look up and face him, but she had to. When she did, his eyes had already betrayed him. Sigurd held out his hand to her. Give me the mask, Samina, and I will show you. Samina slowly shook her head. She had barely heard what he had said. Why? I will show you. Show me what, Sigurd? Show me how wearing a mask gives you reason to murder an innocent living being? Sigurd scoffed. That thing wasn't even human. I put it out of its misery. Samina pulled the mask close to her chest. He wouldn't have it. Whoever this man was, he was surely not the brother who had played with her in the Wildwood, who had protected her from all the perils of the city and worked hard to provide for their family. This isn't you, Sigurd. Suddenly, his eyes grew fierce. You are holding who I am in your hand, Samina. He advanced on her. Samina receded, crawling off the boulder. Give it to me and you will know. This is not you, Sigurd. You don't need this. You are my brother. You're a good man. You don't need... <laughs> she felt her back suddenly bumping into cold stone. Inadvertently, she had backed away from him and now she was cornered between Sigurd and the gate to the abyss. She felt numb, like either she had no more tears to shed or she simply couldn't accept the reality of it all. The world is not as simple as you would like it to be, Samina. She clutched the mask in both hands, a desperate grip. I know the voice of temptation is powerful. I know they did something to you. But you can fight back. You can still return. Sigurd narrowed his eyes and pursed his lips. You don't know the first thing about the world, Samina. You're innocent and ignorant. You have seen nothing. But I, I have seen the darkness ahead. His eyes were wide with terror. Seen it firsthand. This wasn't Sigurd who was speaking. This raving madman had nothing in common with the brother she had loved. He had to still be in there somewhere. Why do you need this mask, Sigurd? What good will you do with it? What will it serve? Isn't it just a symbol of the evil that... Shut up! Samina breathed in deeply. She would not give in to the tangled mass of feelings rushing at her from some darkness below. She would not. What have they done to you? He came closer, towering over her and grinning maliciously. His teeth and eyes gleamed in Samina's floating light. What they've done to me? You want to know that, sis? Then give me the mask and you will know what they've done to me. Samina shook her head frantically. No. We need to wait until Ludlov is here. She had to buy time somehow. We won't wait. Give me the mask now. His pose and his face told Samina he was a mere moment away from simply tearing the mask from her hands. It suddenly reminded her of the time when they were children 
and Sigurd used to tease her by taking her toys and playing with them. She used to plead with him. Give it back, she would say. And then he would answer, If you can catch me. With those words, Samina planted her right knee in Sigurd's groin and slipped away. She dashed between the rocks, away from Sigurd. She had no idea where to go in this forsaken chasm, but it would be away from him. The sharp rocks hurt, even through her calloused footsoles, but she would keep on running, 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 her heartbeat racing, the muscles in her legs burning with exertion. In front of her, she could only see fog and darkness, but it didn't matter. It was away from him. Then a wall of black feathers materialized right in front of her. She stopped dead in her track, stumbling back. The feathers disappeared, revealing Sigurd. He grabbed her by the arms and pulled her close to him. Bad decision, sis. Ravens fly faster than little girls can run. Give me the mask. Goddess, what had her brother become? Samina felt herself weaken in his grip. He let go of one arm and easily slipped the mask from her powerless fingers. As he brought the mask to his face, Samina heard a terrible sound of squeezed flesh and stretching sinews. She witnessed how the mask sucked itself to Sigurd's face. The skin around his eyes tightened. The veins in his temples swelled to the surface, looking like the twisting branches of a winter tree. Behind the mask sockets, his eyes lit up with an orange light. The light of the seven stones. His voice sounded distorted and yet clear and loud, and more strangely, it sounded like it came from all around Samina. This is what I have become, Samina, and now it is time to open the gate. He pulled at her arm, dragging her along with him as he called out to the gate, Open gates of oblivion! The raven brings the pure blood. Every muscle in Samina's body felt like it was on fire. She had no idea where the pain came from, but it shocked her out of all other thoughts, reducing her to a limp and helpless thing. She wanted to cry out, but no cry came. As her vision blurred and the world began to fade out into gloom, she thought she saw someone approaching. A long coat and a tall hat with a wide brim. Darkness. Ludlov ran as fast as he could, knowing it would never be fast enough. The gate hadn't opened in any traditional sense. It had simply faded and turned into a glimmering vertical pool of black stagnant water. The masked one had already stepped through it and simply disappeared. Samina, halfway into the gate herself, reached for him with one free arm, her eyes huge with shock and terror. Her face disappeared behind the black water, then her outstretched hand. Then she was gone, and the light with her. At once, the world lost all color, turning into a shadow realm of black and gray shapes. This gate would not remain open for much longer, Ludlov knew. The cold, rippling gateway stared him in the face, daring him to ignore his natural instincts and run headfirst into it. He knew it was possible, he had seen the masked one do it. Ludlov took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and dashed forward. Coldness washed over him, like he had actually fallen into a black pool in the heart of winter. The cold pressed on him from all sides, like some ice titan from the legends of the northern barbarians was crushing him in his fist. He couldn't think and didn't dare to breathe. It lasted long, too long. He couldn't think. A piercing pain entered through his forehead and spread through his brain, into his neck and down to his shoulders. More pain arrived, different pain, like little bird claws scratching at his eyeballs. 
It was horrendous, and it only became worse. He instinctively gasped for breath, but all that entered was pure coldness that hurt in his throat and lungs. His whole body hurt now, and he was aware of nothing but the pain. Then it ended. The last ghost of the pain fled from his body. Warm relief flowed through him. He shuddered and breathed in wonderful, soft, ordinary air. Beyond his still-closed eyelids, he became aware of the flickering light of fire. He smelled incense and burned flesh. His eyes felt glued shut, but he managed to open them. He was on his knees, looking at his gloved hands. He was still in one piece. He even had his hat, which was lying beside him. There were rocks all around him. Trembling, Ludlov got up and carefully appeared over the rubble in front of him. He was just tall enough to be able to do so without having to climb. It was a cave so massive it could easily have hosted a small farming village. There were thousands upon thousands of torches lit all around, like little flickering stars in a rocky firmament. Most of the cave consisted of natural rock formations, but there were also elegantly carved balconies, stairways, columns and platforms there, as well as hundreds of little doorways leading to unseen places. It reminded Ludlov of an underground version of the ruins of Urba Classica he had once seen, but some of the shapes were also similar to elements from the Grand Cathedral. Here in this cave, the delicacy of the artwork felt strangely out of place. In front of him, he saw Samina and that masked one, hardly more than a dozen yards away. She was standing beside that man now, head bowed, looking at her feet. Beyond them, the ground sloped down and suddenly ended. Most of the cave looked down on a huge, gaping hole, black as night. The darkness of that place was alive, Ludlow thought. He could feel it breathe somehow, even though it didn't move or make a sound. He just felt it. It was undoubtedly the abyss. The open wound in the earth that gave way to hell where Lucas lived. Looking into that blackness, Ludlow suddenly felt deeply afraid when he realized he was looking straight into the evil's den. On the far side, there was a great half-circle balcony at least 50 feet wide. The balcony had no railings. It simply hung precariously over the abyss, almost like a challenge. Sigurd? Samina lifted her head to the masked one. For the first time, Ludlov noticed the man's clothes. They were indeed Sigurd's. This was deeply troubling. You will see, Samina, the distorted voice said from beyond the mask. That voice was utterly unrecognizable as Sigurd's, but Ludlov knew he had heard it before, back in the tunnels and in the Sanctissima. Had Sigurd murdered the storyteller? Had he stolen the stones? Out of the many doorways all around the cave, figures appeared Ludlov had not seen before. They were unusually tall and slender, clad in black robes. They didn't walk, rather they slowly glided onto the many balconies with an unsettling solemnity. Beneath their black hoods were eyes, eyes like full moons much like he had seen in the children of the ghost streets, but these beings were very different. They bore an immeasurable sadness in their luminous white eyes. A sadness that was almost painful to look at. More and more of them appeared, soundlessly filling the edges of the cave to the nook. There they stood, in silence. On the great balcony on the far side of the cave, another figure approached with proud strides. Ludlov was startled to notice that this one somehow looked like himself from afar. It was a man in the same witch-hunter uniform, but when he looked up and his face became visible beneath his hat, 
he saw that it was almost entirely eaten away by fire. The man was too far away to get a clear look, but that face was corched and blackened, almost skeletal. No man could be so severely wounded and walk with such casual verve. More terrifying than his appearance, more soul-crushing, was the voice Ludlov recognized when the man called out across the abyss. Sigurd, bring the pure blood. No, Ludlov thought. It cannot be. The mellifluent baritone voice unmistakably belonged to Adomir. Who is that? Sigurd didn't respond to Samina's question, merely gesturing for her to follow him. He took a few steps in the direction of the gaping chasm, and as he neared it, a narrow bridge of stone extended out of the rock towards the balcony on the other side. Sigurd crossed it with confident steps, his grey robe billowing behind him. Samina hesitated but eventually followed him. Her steps were timid, so unlike the lively and optimistic woman Ludlov had come to know. The three figures met on the far balcony. They were so far away now Ludlov would have to concentrate to hear what they were saying. He wished he could get closer but that was impossible without revealing his presence. He knew that he would eventually have to come out of his hiding, but he wanted to wait until the opportune moment. Simultaneously, he had to suppress the urge to rush across that bridge and protect Samina with his life. Sigurd's unnatural voice carried well over the vast abyss. Samina, my sister, meet the teacher. He gestured theatrically. And Adomir, was it really Adomir? Bowed to Samina with what seemed to be genuine respect. Welcome, Samina, to our magnificent gala. As our guest of honor, you will receive special treatment. A new reserve of strength was kindled in Samina's heart. She didn't know what had triggered it, but it was as if a voice had called to her from within and had awoken her from a shocked, dreamlike state. Sigurd's mind was overtaken. She had to accept that. If she didn't, she would be next. For the sake of both of them, for the sake of everyone, she had to be strong now. Who are you, monster? She was not about to be intimidated by this burned face. Some call me the teacher, but my name is Adomir. Adomir? Ludlov's mentor? You can't be. Oh, you have heard of me, have you? Adomir seemed genuinely pleased with himself. I hope Ludlov had favorable things to say. He won't anymore once he finds out what you really are. Adomir took a step closer. His face was ravaged with burns. On its left side, his bare cheekbone and the sinews of his cheek were exposed to the air. The skin around his eyes and his forehead was still tight, though reddened, and his charismatic eyes were big, deep, and dark. I am merely your host, Samina. Your safety and well-being are important to us. Retrieve the chains, Sigurd. The masked magician bowed to his master and strode to a doorway in the rocky wall of the cave. One half of Adamir's face convulsed. Only when Samina forced herself to look him in the eye did she realize it was actually a smile. You are an extraordinary young woman, Samina. Much more so than you have any inkling of. Sigurd returned out of the doorway, carrying a long, heavy chain in his hands. Don't touch me! Samina felt the urge to step backward, but she was afraid of the abyss behind her back. Desperation lured her from the corners of her mind as the brother for whom she had risked so much approached, hidden behind a monstrous mask, ready to ensnare her in metal. Do not be afraid, young lady. 
We won't hurt you. Do not touch me! Sigurd maintained his steady approach. This is only for your own safety, Samina. I wish to show you something. Samina, it's your brother. You know I wouldn't harm you. It sounded grotesque in the mask's voice. But you're one of them, Sigurd. This is not you. The masked Sigurd shook his head. Sam, I'm doing this for you. Trust me, you don't know what darkness still lies ahead. I won't hurt you. This is not you. She looked around. There had to be a way to escape, an exit, something. Where is Ludlow? Ludlow? She heard her own voice echoing through the cave, lonely and helpless. The figures on the many balconies stared at her with their sad, empty, bulbous eyes. Ludlow! The teacher, Ludlow thought. Adomir. The same man who had taught Ludlow the value of discernment and the balance between compassion and moral fortitude was the one who had commanded the death of all magicians. He couldn't fathom it. Ludlow? Ludlow's heart skipped a beat. He had heard Samina's voice right next to him, like she had been whispering straight into his ear. She was here, with him, even if she stood on the other side of the massive cave. He could feel it. He closed his eyes. Samina... Ludlow concentrated, squeezing his eyes shut, focusing all of his mind on the connection. This was an entirely new experience for the grizzled witch hunter. He had often had to fight back against forces bent on invading his mind, but he had never attempted to actually maintain a telepathic connection, let alone send a message of his own. I am here, Samina. I swear... They will not hurt you without going through me first. He would only have to find a way to cross that bridge without drawing their attention. If that was even possible. No, no, no thoughts now. Listen. Ludlow, I am with you. His heart raced. She was comforting him. And I am with you, Samina. Meanwhile... He could see how Sigurd had bound her hands and feet in his chain. Samina could no longer hear Ludlov. She had never established this connection with a non-magician before. It amazed her that she had succeeded at all, even for a few moments. Adomir approached her, and she looked away. Samina, look at me. No! Just... Look at me. Look into my eyes. Only there will you see the truth. No. She shook her head, looking everywhere except where he directed her. No, I can't. His voice grew in volume, even though its tone remained patient and soft. All you will see is the truth, Samina. Pure truth. Just Look. No! There was a moment of quiet. Grab her head. Sigurd obeyed immediately. Samina felt the hands of her brother, her once brother, roughly clasping the sides of her head and turning it in Adamir's direction. She snapped at his fingers, but he closed her mouth, burying his thumb and index finger in her cheeks. All she could produce were muffled cries of pain and protest. Ludlow! Ludlow's heart raced with fury. His body was poised to rush out of his hiding place and attack both his former mentor and Samina's brother. But he knew he shouldn't. Not yet. If they wanted to kill her, they'd be able to do so long before he could cross that bridge. Samina... He squeezed his eyes shut, trying hard to establish that connection again. Nothing happened. Of course it didn't. He was not a mage. What could he do? Ludlow. He heard her again, 
He closed his eyes again, softly this time. Suddenly, a clear image appeared in front of him. He saw Adomir's deformed face right in front of him. Not only was it ravaged by fire beyond anything a human could survive, but there was something else wrong with it. His eyes were different. Lord Adomir had always had fierce, dark eyes, but the deep brown of his irises had now become the unfathomable blackness of the abyss, and in the midst of those oily circles there was a flame, dancing like a candle in a gust of wind. Look, Samina, Adomir said, peering straight at Ludlov. Look deep. No, Ludlov realized. Adomir wasn't looking at him. He was looking at Samina. Ludlov was seeing what Samina saw. His eyes, they are so intense. The flame within. I can't watch. I mustn't watch. The fire. fire. Ludlov shared Samina's thoughts and feelings like they were one and the same. Follow the flame, Samina. The flame in my eye. Follow it. See how it dances and guides you through the long dark. Follow it past memory, into the unrecorded past. No. Ludlow focused to pull out of the illusion, out of this mind melt, but he couldn't even open his eyes. Whatever had begun, he couldn't stop it now. They were leaving the here and now. Where am I? Samina was vaguely aware of the drowsy sound of her own voice. All is dark. I am showing you the past. She could no longer see Adomir, or Sigurd, or the cave. You are witnessing the world's memory in my eyes. Look. The darkness faded, evolving into a swirling mass of grey smoke. Somewhere in that fog, she could discern blurry spots of light. One of the lit-up areas became larger, like it was coming nearer, and in that light she could now see colours, and then shapes, until an image appeared that then became sharp and clear, and all the sounds and smells that came with it were there too and Samina believed it was real. A hand, black as coal, its skin flaking like dried paint, was holding an elegant, sinuously forged sickle. It was a beautiful weapon, with many detailed lines edged into its blade. The sickle veered down towards a woman in a white robe. She was lying on a rocky surface. Her face was turned away from Samina, but just by the line of her neck and the side of her cheek just visible beyond her dark hair, Samina could tell that she was the most beautiful being the world could ever know. The maiden. The sickle slashed into her belly, and bright red blood streamed out of her body, over her robes. It was redder than any mortal's blood, a color so deep and warm it was as if only now Samina learned what red meant. The horror. Don't turn away, Samina. Watch. Watch her blood. The the brightest red I've ever seen. Yes, it is. Her blood is sacred. It is pure. Good. Now see what happens. What do you see? The image of the maiden was gone dissolved into the dark clouds once more. Somewhere far beneath that grey mass were mountains, valleys, woods. Somber clouds over a somber world. In the midst of the clouds, something small appeared. It was ruby red. A ruby drop of rain, perfectly shaped, ready to fall. The beautiful red drop fell from the cloud all the way down to the surface of the earth. 
and she could follow its journey up close. But the drop didn't splash like rain. It just landed and lay there, perfectly still. And then it began to move. The drop, it grows. I, s- I see a shape. A shape? What shape? The red is becoming brighter. It's turning to light. Bright, white light. It was so bright that it would have hurt her eyes, but it didn't. If anything, the vigor of that light felt like healing. Sacred light. The light faded, turning inward into the shape. Then Samina saw. What had been a bright red drop was now a beautiful newborn baby crying helplessly. She was the first. Elena. Seven divine drops rained down to our sinful world. Seven little girls were born centuries ago. That is what really happened to the blood of the maiden. In the clouds, more little drops could be seen, plummeting down. And Lucus was banished to hell for what he did, condemned to remain there until compassion returns to his heart, for the goddess always leaves the door open to forgiveness. However, Chained there in the deep and thoughtful quiet below, the black fire in his heart only grew. Compassion never came. Instead, he turned the tranquility of his prison into the insanity of hell. Ludlove's eyes shot open. Without warning, the whole vision was gone. He was once again huddled behind a rocky mass, looking out over the cave. His head was spinning, but that sensation gradually receded. As the here and now returned to him, he was overwhelmed by what he had experienced. The vision itself had been a revelation of immense proportions, of course. But despite his years of study and his deep-seated love of history, theology and philosophy, he found he could barely think about what the vision had told him. Instead, he reflected on how his whole mind and heart had joined with Samina's, how close he had been to her, a closeness he had experienced only once before. He closed his eyes again, basking for a moment in that feeling. All the world might end tonight, but he would allow himself that one moment of grace. The moment passed, and he had to open his eyes again and face the world. Do you know who you are, Samina? Adamir's voice barely penetrated her consciousness, still wrapped in the passing connection to Ludlov. Samina? Sigurd's heavy hand on her right shoulder brought her back. Let me go. You have no need of me. She was numb and couldn't hear Ludlov anymore. Samina, listen to me. This is important. She shook her head. What was this man going on about? Where is Ludlov? Samina, you are a pure blood. The blood of the maiden. She turned to face him. Why would I care about what you have to say, Adomir? How do I even know this vision you showed me is true? Where do you even get the power to show me these things? Adomir smiled, unfazed. Look around you, Samina. There on the balconies. Samina looked at the dark figures gathered there. Their unchanging eyes were so melancholy, she found it hard to look at them. Those are the lost souls. They sinned. Those who sin belong to Lucus. Some of these souls are very, very old. 
old enough to know the origins of the purebloods. I was able to bond with them and learn what they know. Not just their knowledge, but also their skills. Samina didn't want to believe him, but she did. I have learned much magic from those lost souls, Samina. Do not worry. You have not to fear from them. They cannot harm anyone, lost as they are. What I showed you came from them. Trust me, you are a pure blood. The blood of the maiden herself, flowing in Semina's veins. It was both alarming and uplifting to her. She wanted to say something insulting to Adomir, but found herself too overwhelmed with this new knowledge to do so. And you are more than that. You are the first pure blood, after centuries of time, who carries the blood of all seven drops. The bloodlines have converged in you. She looked at the monstrous man. How could he speak of such sacred things? Had he not commanded the Magicide Act? The Seven Mothers came to the world 1600 years ago. There was Elena, honesty. Samara, gentleness. Idonea, strength. Donaya, perseverance. Brisea, humility. Maria, purity. And Samina the First, sacrifice. Fate willed it that your mother chose that name for you. I don't understand. How can I have the blood of all seven in me? My parents were ordinary people. That ghastly convulsion that was supposed to be a smile returned to Adomir's visage. Ordinary people, yes. But in his long line of ancestry, your father carried the blood of Elena, Brisea, and Maria. Your mother was descended from Samara, Idonea, Donaya, and Samina. Samina shrugged. How does that make me a pure blood? I'm half pure gypsy, half pure Evenenborg. The pure bloods are named so not because their line is pure. They are unusual women who appear from time to time throughout history. Always in a bloodline that can be traced back to one of the seven, yes. But having that bloodline in itself does not mean you are pure blood. If fate had decreed otherwise, your mother might have given birth to a perfectly ordinary daughter. With some magical talents, perhaps, but nothing special. Yet something... Something greater than all of us decided for you to be the one. Never before has there been anyone like you, Samina. But how do you even know I'm such a pureblood at all? I'm just a Sindra girl. Adomir came uncomfortably close to her and breathed in deeply. Was he smelling her? Ludlove would be able to tell you, Samina. You are. A pure blood. Unfortunately, he is not here. I expect he will be here soon. I would have preferred it to have him here. He deserves an answer at least, and he deserves to bear witness. Bring the chest, Sigurd. He glanced back for a moment. Then he was pleased to settle his gaze on Samina again. He's a good man, good love. Strong-minded, courageous, single-minded. He touched Samina's chin and lifted her face up. But he would not have been able to make this sacrifice. He wasn't strong enough for that, I fear. Samina shook her head free of Adamir's touch. Ludlov's made enough sacrifices in his life. He lost his wife, and it almost destroyed him. Adomir shook his head sadly. You still do not see, do you? Who do you think his wife was? Samina forced herself to look at him. Maria. Her name was... Maria. Sigurd returned, 
carrying a heavy black chest trimmed with silver. Yes, the ancient text said that the one would bear a name of one of the original drops. For a moment, we thought Maria might be our chosen one. But she wasn't. You are. As Sigurd lowered the chest down to the balcony floor, Samina felt its weight press down on her heart. Can you make a sacrifice, Samina? Adomir produced a silver key from his breast pocket. With a last meaningful glance, he turned away from Samina and strode towards Sigurd to hand over the key. The masked one accepted the key and used it to unlock the chest. Then he knelt down and reverently opened the lid. There was pity in his eyes. With both hands, Sigurd lifted something from the chest. As Adomir stepped aside and Sigurd turned towards her, Samina could see what it was. A beautifully crafted weapon, forged in the darkest metal she had ever seen. This is the Black Sickle. The weapon used by Lucus to slay the Maiden. And now, it will be the weapon used by the Maiden to slay Lucus. His eyes burned, and in the act, she will die herself. He turned to face her. It is time, Samina. Time for the final sacrifice. So that was this week's episode of Witch Hunter. We'll be back next Thursday with the adventures of Ludlove and Samina. If you want to find out more about Witch Hunter, you can find us at audio-epics.com. And we also have a Facebook page, the Audio Epics Facebook page. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>